Good morning, everyone. It is a fine fall afternoon for RI Elder Info's third annual virtual senior resource fair. And for those of you who are just joining for the very first time, I am Deb Burton, the executive director and founder of RI Elder Info and creator of rielderinfo.com. And we started this virtual senior resource fair in 2020 when COVID hit, because as we all know, COVID had a massive impact on our older adults and our caregivers and the professionals who served them. And so we wanted to make sure that we were able to reach out to get people the information and resources they needed in order to make informed choices on how to stay independent for as long as possible. Because here at RI Elder Info, we believe information is power and nobody should struggle to live a healthy, safe, dignified life from a lack of it. So now every year in the fall, we bring you our virtual senior resource fair. And it's really important that you hit the like button and the share button, send this out to your friends, your neighbors, any groups that you're in, your communities, because we're talking about literally the white hot topics in older, uh, older adults and caregiving today. I mean, these are the biggies. So it's really important that you hit the like and you hit the share because there is, I am 100% certain, somebody you know who needs the information that we're talking about today. So the other fun things that RI Elder Info does, just in case you're not familiar with us, is every Friday, at 9 a.m., we have a little show called Friday Friends, where we interview different nonprofits from around the state in order to get the information out about them and get you connected to those resources. In the spring, early spring, late winter, early spring, we have our annual Calling All Women Warriors event, where we speak with experts on topics that are important to the women who have served our nation and our women veterans. And then in late spring, early summer, we will be having our fourth annual Calling All Veterans Day, which is one of the biggest resource fairs for our military members, our veterans, and the families that take care of them. Now, I want to be clear, we do do a lot of things with veterans, but I am not a veteran. I just believe here that if you've signed on the dotted line to give me ease of life and freedom, then it's my responsibility to give back what I can. And what I can is the information and resources that RI Elder Info has. So super important to get that information out. Um, I want to say it was January of 2021, uh, we were part of a group called Operation Connect that meets the needs of veterans, uh, regardless of their service status, regardless of their age or income. And someone mentioned, oh, it'd be great if we had a resource guide to hand out. Well, we had the information for our older veterans so we worked with many organizations that work with younger veterans, and we created Operation Connect. And Operation Connect is the only printed and printable resource guide for military members, veterans, and their families. And it's kept up to date on the RI Elder Info website. You can go right on the top to say where it says resources, and you can download that for free at any time. So it's, it's one of those things that is a, a labor of love. So the other things that RI Elder Info has done, especially since COVID hit, you know, we are dedicated to educating the community and getting the word out about resources. We're also really happy to come out and talk to your community groups, at your libraries, at your religious organizations, to really help folks understand what it takes to remain independent as we age. You know, it's a, it's a funny thing when you've got kids who are going to college, it's kind of normal to reach out to get 
explanations about how do we do these college applications and how do we fill out the financial aid forms. But when you retire, we don't often talk about, okay, how do we maintain our independence? And RA Elder Info is more than happy to come out to your group for free and have that conversation and answer questions. Easy or hard, it doesn't matter. The other thing we do is when there's questions, maybe as a professional, you come up across that one-off situation, call me, email me, text me. RA Elder Info is here to answer your questions. And if it's something that doesn't have an easy answer, we also participate in a lot of the statewide meetings as a member of the public to make sure that those voices in the community are heard at the state level because we're all in this together. And as a nonprofit, we really couldn't do this without the support of a lot of people. So one of the, the individuals that I would love for you to hear from today is our newly elected, formally elected governor, Mr. Dan McKee. Hello, I'm Governor Dan McKee, and it's an honor to be part of the third annual Rhode Island Elder Info Virtual Senior Resource Fair. Rhode Island Elder Info is a comprehensive resource that our state's aging population can turn to, providing valuable resources, allowing Rhode Island seniors population to maintain independence and to serve as a guide for seniors, their caregivers, and their loved ones. It's so important to allow our state's population to age gracefully and with dignity. Whether it's tax relief, housing, food security, or utilities, my administration is looking at these issues through the lens of ensuring our seniors are able to not just live in the ocean state, but they're able to thrive here. I'm proud to serve Rhode Island's aging community in any way possible, and we want you to live rich, fulfilling lives we celebrate you each and every day and thank you for your contributions to the Ocean State. Thank you to Rhode Island Elder Info and its executive director and founder, Deb Burton. And please visit rielderinfo.com for more information on how this great organization can help you and your loved ones. I am really glad that Dan had a moment to be able to pre-record that because he's been in a, quite a bit of a whirlwind, as you can imagine. Let me tell you, this event and all the work we do would not be possible without the support of our annual sponsors. So I wanted to say a big shout out and thank you to Aetna, to Oak Street Health, to United Health to Neighborhood Health, and to Tamarisk Assisted Living. They support our work all year long. And now, if you were able to join us last week at the Edward King House, we brought 48 resource providers out into the community to get people connected. And today, we are bringing this show to you through the help of our event sponsors. So I would like to hear um, real quick from Katherine Taylor from AARP, one of our wonderful supporters for these events. Katherine? Good morning, Deb. How's my sound? Can you hear me all right? Can hear you. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad uh, to see you all here on this resource fair. And we're so happy to see you all were able to join us live last week at the Edward King House. And just want to thank Deb Burton and Rhode Island Elder Info for pulling together all of these resources for all of you and for sharing the resources of AARP Rhode Island. Um, please um, come visit us on our website at aarp.org slash ri. Very easy. And you can see all the free events that we have um, virtually and um, and uh, sort of local discounts and sponsorships and also so many resources for you in terms of caregiving, in terms of fraud watch, fraud prevention, um, teletown halls we have coming up with um, our state leaders. So please do um, come check us out, see what we have to offer and um, enjoy today. There's so, so many rich resources and thank you, Deb, for bringing them to all of the older adults in our great state. Catherine, AARP truly is a wonderful partner, and the amount of information and resources you guys provide to the community really is astounding. Thank you so much for your continued support in your various roles, your continued support for our older adults. Thank you, Catherine. 
Thank you, Deb. Have a great day. Thank you. And how about Oakley Home Access? They have been a wonderful supporter through a wide variety of our programs, and they have a service that really enables people to stay home. Is there a word from Oakley Home Access? Good morning, everybody. My name is Alex Denoncor, and I'm speaking on behalf of the entire Oakley Home Access team. We would like to thank Rhode Island Elder Info for the hard work they do to provide seniors with beneficial resources for successful aging. Our team is a dedicated group of professionals that specializes in home assessment and home modification to assist with aging in place, accessibility, and fall prevention. The idea of aging in place is that with the proper resources and planning, one can live safely in their home, comfortably, regardless of age, income, or ability levels. We at Oakley Home Access aim to be one of those resources for you. We assess for and install home modifications such as ramps, stair lifts, grab bars, and more. For more information or to start the process, please reach out to us at 401-429-3882 or check out our website at www.oakleyhomeaccess.com. Please enjoy the event, stay safe, and we hope to see some of you in your home very soon. Thank you. Have a great day. Good, good. That was great messaging from Oakley Home Access. It's good to have a trusted partner that supports the work that we do. And I would like to hear from Mary Talbot from Pace, which is one of those little hidden gems here in the state that really needs to be uncovered for more people to know about. Mary? Hey, thank you. Good morning, Deb. Pace is glad to really, really glad to participate in this resource fair. In fact, we've been a trusted resource for families here in Rhode Island for almost two decades. We're a nonprofit organization that serves as both an insurer and a provider of care with locations in Newport, Woonsocket, Westerly, and East Providence. Our participants are people who are 55 years of age or older, and they're living with chronic health conditions. Our goal at PACE is to ensure that everyone we serve has the opportunity to age with the autonomy they want the support they need, and the dignity that they deserve by delivering exceptional and equitable health care. We work hard to make certain that our participants can keep living in their homes and in the communities where they feel comfortable and welcome. So if you'd like to learn more about PACE, please visit our website at pace-ri.org. Thank you and have a great day, Deb. Thank you. It is one of those wonderful resources that is out there for folks. So for everybody watching, I'm really kind of curious, where are you watching from? Drop a hello and just as much as you feel comfortable, share what city or town you're in. Um, I would be really curious to see where folks are coming in from. You know, I, I have a big shout out to the Alzheimer's Association. They have been a wonderful partner. And I know that they're having a little technical difficulties behind the scenes. So their messaging might come through a little bit later in the show. And Washington Trust. I have to say, Brian Mahone has been a wonderful resource for a lot of different services for our older adults. And Washington Trust is one of the banks here in Rhode Island that really led the charge in getting all of their employees educated on recognizing elder financial abuse and taking steps to reduce the risk for individuals and really have those conversations with their, with their, um, their customers in how to remain safe financially as they age. So a huge shout out to Washington Trust. They have been a wonderful group for us to, to work with. And you know, it's many organizations are doing some really incredible work and they are in turn supporting our work. So I wanna give a big thank you to Butler Memory and Aging. They are really one of the leaders in the country for research on Alzheimer's disease and other related dementias. CareLink, CareLink has a new program that brings programming for individuals with dementia right into their homes to help people stay connected when they have a diagnosis of dementia. Commonwealth Care Alliance, they're a new provider here in the state. They've been here for about 18 months and they are providing really comprehensive services for individuals who um, need a lot of medical assistance. We also have the Foundation for Financial Freedom. Uh, Nicholas Pacheco is really a big advocate 
for making sure that people are educated on the finances of growing older. Home mobility pros, they do full home run full home renovations as needed. They really specialize in the bathrooms, which we don't often think of, but your bathroom is usually one of the most dangerous places where you're most likely to fall. Newport Mental Health, they have been a wonderful resource. Aging is not something that necessitates a diagnosis of, di of depression and anxiety. And that's not a normal part of aging. Mental illness is not a normal part of aging. So if you're experiencing those things, I encourage you reach out to Newport Mental Health, or you can always dial 988. Oakley Home Access, you've heard from them today. They are absolutely fabulous. If you're eligible, there are other services through the Ocean State Center for Independent Living. They can help you modify your home in ways that are meaningful to you specifically. What I mean by that is if you think about maybe you or someone you care about goes up and down into the basement to do the laundry, maybe not the best choice over time. And what OSIL is able to do is get your washer and dryer onto the main floor. They can do grab bars and they can do ramps. They have hearing aid assistance. They provide a wealth of resources. They do have some guidelines as to who's eligible, but those guidelines are very generous and they're always happy to talk to new people about how they can meet their needs and things that are important to them. Also, Visiting Nurse Home and Hospice, one of those organizations that's able to go out to your house and give you the care that you need. They do have staffing that covers the vast majority of the state. So if you're watching, give Visiting Nurse Home and Hospice a call and White Cross Pharmacy. White Cross Pharmacy is one of those pharmacies that is still family owned. It's located right here in Rhode Island. It's not some big conglomerate. They prepackage your medication for free and deliver it to your door for free. And it's one of those things that can really help resolve the risk of what's called polypharmacy or medication mismanagement, which is often one of those things that can lead to um, unfortunate events that require hospitalization. So I encourage you to check out White Cross Pharmacy. So our day would not be complete if we did not have the new been there less than a year and really kicking butt and taking names, the new director for the Rhode Island Office of Healthy Aging. Welcome, Maria. Deb. Hello, Deb. I'm so excited to be here and thank you for the invitation. Oh, I'm excited to have you because in the short amount of time you've been there, you are just making things awesome. So thank tell you. Tell everybody what Office of Healthy Aging is and does. Sure, I'm happy to. So the Office of Healthy Aging here in Rhode Island used to be known as the Division of Elderly Affairs. But as you so uh, kindly spoke about this morning, like aging is not just about being at home and, and um, having the, the aging process happen to you, which is kind of how elder sounds like it's a stagnant space. But we want to ensure that people are aging and being healthy and being able to live the life that they want to live. So several years ago, the office changed its name to Healthy Aging to focus on that, that aging is a process that we begin at birth. And we want to make sure that people can age in the way that um, suits their needs and their desires and what they hope for for their families. So at the Office of Healthy Aging, um, I'm actually, as the director, a member of the governor's cabinet, and I can echo what Governor McKee said earlier. Uh, seniors, older adults are top of mind for his administration and really important to his goals for Rhode Island. He and the Office of Healthy Aging have a goal of making sure that Rhode Island is a great place to grow up in and to grow old in. And so what we do here at OHA, sometimes called OHA or OHA, is that uh, we are a state agency that works closely in partnership with other state agencies and community agencies like yours to ensure that older adults and their caregivers and adults with disabilities in the state um, have access to the services that they need. We are a pretty small team. We're a team of 31 uh, folks here at our state agency. Um, and so what we try to be sure is that we identify the things that we can do 
the things that we can convene and the things that we can amplify. Um, and so in that sense, we try to learn from older adults, their caregivers, our community partners, what are the things that people need and what are the things that people want? Because life isn't just about our needs as much as we need to make sure that people's basic needs are being met and we support that through nutrition programs and connecting people to health resources and um, connecting people to home modification. But it's also about what they want. You know, decades ago, there was that big move to deinstitutionalize folks. Um, and what that meant was, is that government's kind of pendulum swing moved everyone from one space to another space. And in both ways, they leave people behind. And aging, I think of in that sense, so often people want to just pendulum swing and said, oh, once you hit this age, this is the place for you to be. When in fact, everyone has individual needs and desires based on with their communities, their families, what they prefer. And for some people, that means that they want to stay in their home, the place that they have lived for decades, maybe raised their children. And in order to do that, they might need that home modification to make sure their bathroom is safe. They might need someone to deliver meals to them because cooking isn't safe for them anymore. Um, and so the Office of Healthy Aging supports organizations in the community financially so that they can, people do have access to delivered meals um, and do have access to home modification. And other people may not want to stay in that large home where they raised a family, but want to stay in their neighborhood. It's where their faith community is, it's where their friends are, it's where their local senior center is. And so we want, we work closely with our partners who work on housing to ensure that there are differing types of housing opportunities available. Because um, in some ways, housing, is, housing needs are similar for everyone. People need a place where they feel safe and they can afford their housing. But in other ways, housing um, needs of people who are older or adults with disabilities are a little different. They also need to be accessible. They might need want to be one floor instead of multiple floors. We may be looking at houses that are closer to 1,000 square feet than 2,000 square feet, just for uh, an ability to maintain that property. So while we don't do housing at the Office of Healthy Aging, we bring the voices of older adults and their caregivers to those housing spaces. We also really work to address issues of social isolation. You shared, Deb, earlier how this uh, fabulous uh, is a Senior Center Resource Fair is the third virtual one because of COVID, which turned all of our lives upside down. And social isolation was something that was an issue for some older adults pre-COVID. It was sometimes difficult for them to get out of their homes. Maybe they weren't comfortable driving anymore. Maybe they had mobility issues. And so we, during COVID at the Office of Healthy Aging, we partnered on some technology initiatives to get resources to older adults and partnered with colleges, with the University of Rhode Island to have uh, younger people teach those older adults how to use those tech resources if those, that kind of skill building was necessary. That digi age program, as we call it, continues and we connect Sometimes when people, uh, older adults are being discharged from hospitals or nursing homes, um, they're given tech devices so that they can remain in contact with their family members and friends. And that's addressing the social isolation that people felt during COVID. And at the same time, we also support our congregate spaces, our community spaces, our senior centers, which are so important and provide older adults places to socialize, to learn new skills, to have meals, to have health act, healthcare access. All of those things are not done specifically by the Office of Healthy Aging, but are supported by the Office of Healthy Aging as we try to ensure that older adults have the space and the ability to age as they want. One of the things that I noted when you were talking about the hidden gem of PACE, and I agree, it's a hidden gem. There's something about the phrasing of that that reminded me that aging is so unique and so nuanced to the individual and the life that they've led and the life that they want to live. Um, and so it's really one of the things that we've tried to do here at the Office of Healthy Aging is to ensure that we're creating opportunity fostering opportunity, amplifying opportunities um, 
for meeting people's cultural desire needs or traditions to meeting people where they are geographically. Rhode Island's not big, but we all know that no one in Westerly wants to move to Providence in order to, to, to live out the rest of their life. They wanna stay in their community. So we try to be geographically diverse and culturally diverse. Um, and also remind folks that it's never too late. You know, last year, the CCRI graduate speaker was a person who is over 60 years old who uh, completed his associate's degree. So we also want to highlight the fact that growing older doesn't mean that you're necessarily getting sick or necessarily being frail. And while we need to have resources for folks who need those supports, we also need to find spaces to celebrate new opportunities, new adventures, achieving new goals in, in older adulthood. In addition to the supports that we provide financially to community organizations for nutrition assistance, respite care for caregivers, um, at, and at-home supports for folks who need them, we also manage the state's open enrollment efforts, as you all know, hopefully, or probably because you've gotten a ton of postcards in the mail. It is Medicare open enrollment time. And if you need help with that, we have a SHIP line, a state health information program line that I'd like to share. That's 800-884-8721, where folks can call and get help uh, determining whether and what their Medicare, uh, the best Medicare plan for them is. We also support our Aging Disability Resource Center, known as The Point. Their phone number is 401-462-4444. And that's a great stop when you're just starting and you don't know where to go. When you or your loved one is recognizing that you need supports to stay in the community or trying to figure out uh, what the best type of uh, aging environment for you is, the folks at the point are really skilled in helping someone decide um, where the best resources are for that person to be able to age as they wish to. And then finally, the thing that I wanted to share that we really do do here at the Office of Healthy Aging is we investigate elder abuse. Now that phrase, can sound a little bit scary. Like people think of the word abuse. They, I know for many people it conjures up like an idea of physical abuse. And unfortunately that does occur, but it's also we investigate issues of self neglect and of financial exploitation. And so one thing I wanna be clear about is that you as a person who cares about your neighbor or a loved one, you don't need to know if it's abuse. If you have concern about someone's safety or you have concern about someone's ability to take care of themselves, you are welcome to call us at the Office of Healthy Aging and report elder abuse. Um, that phone number is 401-462-0555, and it's on the screen right now. And what we can do here is we will, if, as long as the person is over the age of 60, we will take the information about them. You can also report it online. You can tell us whether that you're concerned that someone's caregiver is being abusive. You can tell us that you're concerned that someone's grandchild is stealing their money. You can tell us that you're just concerned about your neighbor. You've noticed that they're not changing their clothes very often or that they don't seem to be eating. And our staff here will make contact with that person ask them what's going on, see if they're okay, see what types of resources that we have to connect them to. And sometimes that's connecting, uh, offering to connect someone to law enforcement or to the attorney general's office if there's a financial scheme or a scam or um, some type of abuse happening. And sometimes it's about offering someone connection to a case management agency who might be able to arrange for home homemaking services or to sit down with someone and help explain to them what their medication is so that they know the reason for the importance of taking it. Um, these are, of course, adults. They have the right to make decisions for their lives. And sometimes we go out and we talk to someone and we have concern, but the person says, no, I'm fine. I'm not, I don't need your services right now. And that's okay. We can say, okay, well, let, I'm just gonna leave my number and if you ever do want to reach out, you're welcome to. And if we get another complaint or another call of concern from someone else, we will reach out again. But we never force ourselves or services on anyone. We would never take someone out of their home if they, um, if, if they are declining our supports. That is the right for people to make that decision. 
but it's our obligation as the Office of Healthy Aging to ensure that they know that there are resources available to them and for them and try to help them to be as healthy as they can be and as safe as they can be as they age. Maria, that was that was awesome. It's good to hear that even if somebody has concerns about their neighbor, that the Office of Healthy Aging, you know, will offer services, but you're not going to go, I don't know, kick in somebody's door and, and <laughs> drag them out and say, like, you're making bad choices. Right. You have to come with us. Like, yeah. it's not like that. It's true. And I mean, honestly, there are times where that's uncomfortable for us. You know, you see someone you as an outsider, you might say, oh, my gosh, that person is struggling, but they're an adult and you know, people get to make their own choices. But I do want to stress that we will always will continue to check on them. If someone continues to call us, we will continue to check because sometimes people um, may need to get to a different level before they're like, you know what, I actually do need some help. Or they need to build that trust relationship where a stranger knocking on their door. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and then with some trust built, they will uh, accept the supports, but we don't force it on anyone. And the other thing, Deb, that I really want your listeners, the watchers to hear is that you don't need to know if it's abuse. Like it can be scary to make a personal decision about what's abuse and what's not. You can call if you're concerned. If you're concerned about someone who is over the age of 60 and their ability to take care of themselves, or you're concerned that someone's caregiver or loved one is not taking care of someone in the way you would want to be taken care of, give us a call. Our staff is trained to identify abuse. Just like we don't diagnose our own health conditions, we go to a doctor for that. Yeah. You don't need to diagnose, you don't need to feel the ownership of making those decisions. And anyone who makes a report to us, it's entirely confidential. We, it will not get back to the person you call on that you were the person who made the call because that can also be uncomfortable for folks. But if you're concerned, don't sit with your anxiety, make a call to us and we'll take it. We'll take it from, from the anxiety from you <laughs> and we'll do what we can to support people in our community to age in the way that is safe and healthy for them as we do in all the other ways that we look to support our older adults. That's awesome. There was a question that came in from Patrick, and he wanted to know if the Office of Healthy Aging is involved in the National Dementia Action Alliance. You know, Patrick, I am not certain. I'm going to play the new card. As Deb said, I've been here just a few months. What I can tell you, though, is that we have been closely working with the Department of Health in Rhode Island on um, an AD, ADPI grant, uh, Alzheimer's Dementia something project, <laughs> um, and have been working closely with a group of community agencies here in Rhode Island, both state agencies, ours, and the Department of Health, the Alzheimer's Association. We um, are engaged in research and supports for adults with Alzheimer's and other related dementias. Um, and we also work those types of supports and that particular community into our respite programs and into our health promotion program. So I have to say, I will look up that particular organization. I'm sorry, I don't know it, but we are very much engaged in um, the the learning about the understanding of and the connection to care for adults with Alzheimer's and other related dementias. Awesome. And Patrick, if you can drop a link to that organization in the chat, because I'm not sure that I've heard of that one either, and I'm really curious about it. So we're always open to hearing from our viewers and the members of the community. So drop that link in the chat so we can all learn about it. Oh, Maria, this has been great. Thank you so much. I know that your schedule is like crazy busy with everything going on and Rhode Island having one of the largest populations over the age of 85. Your day is never boring. <laughs> <laughs> so true. Thank you thank so you. much for having me and thank you for hosting this event. I'm sure it's going to be incredibly helpful to the folks who are listening today and to the kind of network of community that, that you've built. So thank you so much, Deb. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, you know, it wouldn't be possible without all of our sponsors being able to get us the support we need in order to be able to get you the information that you or someone you care about needs. So our next guest is going to be speaking about 
one of these white hot topics and it's dental care that for some strange reason is often more challenging as we get older. So I would like to welcome Janice Schmitz from CCRI's Dental Hygiene Clinic. Welcome, Janice. Hi, Deb. Thank you for having me on today. Yes, you have a wonderful program that I can say I have personally used, and it is awesome. Please share okay. with everybody about your program. So at the Community College of Rhode Island, we have an on-campus dental hygiene clinic um, where our students provide um, dental hygiene care to the public. Um, so it's a, um, all of our services are available to the public um, and all community members, including those in um, our older populations. So the dental hygiene treatment is provided by the student under the supervision of licensed dentists and dental hygienists. Um, so that we, you know, it's a way that our students can gain the experience they need and we can be sure that those in the community are, have an avenue to be able to um, obtain oral health care services and achieve good oral health. So with that, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about what some of the services that we have and that what we offer um, to our patients here. So we provide um, complete uh, dental cleanings. We also provide radiographs if they're indicated for the patient. Um, we provide services like fluoride treatments and other types of preventative treatments. Uh, we provide comprehensive healthcare screenings, so things like oral cancer screenings and um, screening for high blood pressure and obstructive sleep apnea. You know, um, we do provide also denture care, which um, for, is uh, an important service for our older populations to make sure that the patients that use dentures and wear dentures have a way to make sure that they are functioning properly so that these um, patients can have good nutrition and um, feel confident with their smile. And we also provide comprehensive oral hygiene instruction that is tailored to the needs of every patient. So if this is something that is a service you would be interested in, um, some details on how the appointment sequences work. Um, all of our services are free of charge, which is great um, for everyone, but especially um, patients that don't have access to dental insurance. Um, our, the appointments are available on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays at either 8 o'clock, um, 10 o'clock, 1 or 3 p.m. And in the spring semester only, we also offer evening appointments at 6 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And just so you know a little bit about how the process works, every appointment is two hours. Um, and like I said, um, all of the treatment is supervised by licensed dent dentists and dental hygienists that work within the clinic. Um, and I do just want to point out that some usually more than one appointment may be needed. And the reason for that, again, is it's a learning environment. Um, there's very close supervision that's happening. And as we go through this process with the students, it sometimes may take a little bit longer than it would in a traditional dental setting. Um, and what's great, too, is we have parking available. There's easy access to the building. Um, I know, Debbie, you had asked me earlier if there was wheelchair accessibility, which, yes, there is. We do whatever we can to try to make sure that our clinic is accessible um, to everybody. Okay. And if just I would also like to just review where the um, clinic is located. So this is located at the Flanagan campus in Lincoln. And the address is here on the screen. It's 1762 Lewis Quisset Pike. And if you would like to make an appointment, you can call the number here listed on the screen. It is 401-333-7250. And Janice, so are you booking very far out into the future or is it kind of easy to get in for an appointment? So that's a great question. Um, at the start of our semesters, uh, we have much more availability. As the semester winds down and um, is coming to a close, some of the appointments can be pushed out to the following semester. So where we stand right now, we are booking for our spring semester, which would start um, late January. And those appointments would be available until um, May because we're, when our campus is closed during the summer and of course spring breaks and um, you know the winter holiday, things like that. So when we return in the spring, that right now is where we're booking for currently. 
Okay. And is there is there parking readily available for people who need to come into the clinic? There is. We have ample parking. It's um, close to the entrance of the building. Um, it, like I said, it's wheelchair accessible. We have um, handicapped parking. Um, so it is easy for patients to access the clinic. And I think that's one of those things that's really, really important that people understand because wheelchair accessibility um, for dental offices is something that is a huge challenge. So your clinic might be one of the very few places that individuals with mobility impairments can actually get the treatment, um, get their teeth cleaned and things. So the students are doing it. Are they like freshman students or have they had some, some experience, some training under their belt first? That's a great question. They are the students that are in their final year of the program. So there are senior dental hygiene students. They spend their first year um, kind of learning, working um, with each other, working on partners, and then they move up to introductory patient care um, in their first year where they recruit their own friends and family as patients. And then when they get to their senior year is when they start to see patients from the public. So they do have um, some experience under their belt. And like I said, they are closely supervised. There is always a faculty member working with them. And can you do the x-rays? And if you can do x-rays, can you send those x-rays to, to the dentist out in the community if somebody has one? We can. And, you know, as I mentioned, with the um, radiographs, we take x-rays if they're indicated for the patient and if the patient meets the criteria to have those x-rays taken. If the patient has a dentist of record, we will forward those radiographs to the dentist so that they have them on hand. Um, we also, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, mentioned whether or not the patients have a dentist. So we always encourage the patients to follow up with their dentist for um, in-depth dental exams. However, a lot of the patients that come to our clinic, they don't have a dental home, um, which is why they're coming to us is because they don't have dental insurance. They don't have a dentist that they regularly see. So in the event of that, um, we do have a list of community centers um, that we can, if we identified a need that they need a dental treatment beyond a dental cleaning, then we do have um, resources of where we can refer that patient to and give them a list of dentists that they could um, reach out to. Are there any limitations to the program, like certain age limits, like you you have to be a certain age um, child, or um, if maybe you had, I don't know, a, a medical history of maybe oral cancer, are there anything that would limit somebody's ability to utilize the services at the CCRI hygiene clinic? The only age limit we have is um, we don't see children under five years old. Okay. So if anyone five years and older is um, welcome to make an appointment. And we do do a thorough medical history review on every patient that comes in. And if there is anything during that medical history review that's identified as a red flag or a concern, then mm -hmm. we um, contact the patient's physician to get clearance and make sure that the patient is um, safe to be treated and that there's no risk of harm to the oral cavity or the patient's overall health. What kind of things should, what, what kind of things might be a red flag for somebody to have a conversation with their medical physician when they're having dental surgery or not surgery, but dental care? If you're having a dental cleaning, things that we look for, um, you know, a lot of, there's a strong link between the oral cavity and the whole body. So anything that presents in the oral cavity certainly can affect a person's overall health and vice versa. So if there are systemic conditions happening, sometimes they will present in the oral cavity before anywhere else. So a lot of um, what some of the things we look for, if we're just doing a plain, like traditional medical history review, would be things like um, joint replacements, a hip or a knee replacement, because that sometimes can warrant that the patient needs to take an antibiotic before their treatment. We look okay. for certain heart conditions, um, you know, heart valve replacements. There's certain uh, health conditions that would warrant pre-medication with an antibiotic first, and we need to get clearance from the, pa uh, the patient and the physician to make sure that we're, you know, checking all the boxes, crossing all the T's, dotting all the I's to make sure that the patient um, is healthy and safe to be treated. And again, do people need to have a particular kind of health insurance um, or uh, 
an advantage plan or a managed care organization or, or specific kind of dental insurance in order to go to the CCRI dental hygiene clinic? Absolutely not. Like I mentioned, all of our services are free of charge. So we don't take any insurance because it's not needed because we don't charge for any services. So it's not like, oh, I show the card and there's not a copay. It's, it's, it's no charge. There is no charge, no charge for services. <laughs> and depending on what types of services that pa- you know the patient may need, some, it could be hundreds or thousands of dollars in treatment they're receiving. Um, so it's, I mean, it's a great value. It's a great resource to the community um, of any age group, but particularly um, to our older populations, because sometimes when you get, depending on what type of insurance you have, um, dental care is not always covered. Exactly. It becomes a lot more challenging as we get older. And then you add in the extra degree of difficulty if you have a mobility impairment. And then Absolutely. all yeah, of a sudden, like, yeah, it gets yeah, bad. So <laughs> between systemic health and oral health, you know, as we get older, if we have more health conditions, that's going to affect our oral health. And if we have oral health issues, that's going to impact some of those health conditions that somebody might already be experiencing. So it's important that the oral component is not left out of the equation. And that's what we try to do at our um, dental hygiene clinic is make sure that these services are available to everyone. That's awesome. And what was the phone number if somebody needed to make an appointment again? If you'd like to make an appointment, um, the dental hygiene clinic's phone number is 401-333-7250. That's awesome. Very good. I'm so glad you came on today, Janice. I have used CCRI's Dental Hygiene Clinic. Uh, One of my best friends is a graduate of that program, and she has a fabulous career now. Um, And I think that this is also one of those things that it's a super hot topic for dental care, because if you've got a bad tooth going on, it, it can go bad real quick for a lot of different things. So this kind of prevention that's easily accessible and free. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's what we do. We focus on prevention, right? We're trying to prevent disease from occurring uh, before it starts. So, um, but you, you need routine care to really have that all fall into place. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. This is Thank you awesome. so much for having me. I appreciate the invitation and um, I love to be able to get the word out there. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> So I'm telling you folks, we're talking to the, about the hot topics today, and it wouldn't be possible without the support of our sponsors. So thank you to the Alzheimer's Association and AARP of Rhode Island, Oakley Home Access, Pace Washington Trust. They're the ones who are really helping us make this happen. And next, I want you to hear about this other little secret The U.S. Department of Agriculture, Jake Sargent, is going to talk about the resources that are available through the USDA. Welcome, Jake. Hi, Deb. Good morning. How how are you? How is everyone? Um, I'm happy to be here today. It's so funny because that USDA that, you know, puts the stamp on our steak that it's good to eat is not something that I think about with what you're going to talk about today. So I'm super excited to have you here today and share what USDA can do for our older adults. Yes, I, I'd be happy to share. And no, that is a common misconception. Uh, USDA is quite the vast agency. Yes, they do agriculture. Yes, they do food safety. Um, but they also have a program called Rural Development. And specifically within Rural Development, uh, I work in single family housing as a loan specialist. So I will review applications that are sent in, deem them eligible, and we can service the loans after that. Um, Specifically, we have a home loan program, the 504 program, that is used and intended to make health and safety repairs to households in a rural area. Um, And yes, you know, rural area in southern New England is quite hard to find. Um, Rhode Island in itself, um, a lot of the state is hard to deem eligible, but the areas of the state that are eligible and are rural, um, we believe that we can help out if you are, you know, struggling to make payments to, you know, fix health and safety hazards in your home, for example, a roof or improving, you know, the accessibility of your home are all things that we welcome and we celebrate and want to help out with. So our program, we offer two types of assistance. 
Um, first, we offer a $10,000 grant or up to a $10,000 grant um, to make those repairs. And to be grant eligible, you have to be both above the age of 62, so you have to be an elder, and then you also have to fall below our grant income limit. Um, so usually, you know, generally speaking, that's below about $25,000 a year. So you are on Social Security or Social Security and a small pension. Um, we try to help out the people who really need it most for our grant income. And that grant does not have to be paid back at any time in the future unless you sell the property within three years. So more often than not, you get um, assistance to help fix your home and you don't have to worry about paying that back. Um, and, you know, worst case scenario, I say worst case, but it's still a pretty good deal. Um, you can get a loan if you are eligible based on income and debt requirements um, for up to $40,000 to make repairs to your home at a 1% rate stretched over 20 years. So even if you were to get a full $40,000 loan to make repairs to your home, um, make them more accessible, that payment that you would be making is supposed to, you know, remain modest and you're not, you know, breaking your bank to make your payment to, um, you know, pay back the roof that you put on your home and, you know, maintain the safety and comfortability that you desire in your home. So that is our assistance that we offer. So if you are eligible, you are eligible up to $50,000 to help fix your home. Um, like I said, you can either get a grant or a loan or both in some cases to help fix those. Um, we do not have any deadlines about applying. We are open year round. We are open um, five days a week, <laughs> Monday through Friday. Um, and usually the application process is the longest part of it. Um, we are like everyone in the country right now looking for people to help out and you know assist with our staffing shortages. But nonetheless, once we get an application, you're in our system and we make it a priority to help the people that need it most. So we have priority processing. In most cases, you know, if you are with a 504 application, you do get priority over our other programs, which include home ownership if you want to buy a home in a rural area. But since you already home already own a home and our goal is to help keep you in that home and keep you safe, um, you are given priority processing. So hopefully that can help speed up the process. Um, additionally, like I said, the biggest things that we run into with um, eligibility for our program is it has to be in a rural area. Um, and you can look at our website um, to you know navigate and see if your home is eligible for a loan or grant to help fix it. Um, outside of that, you are welcome to call our Warwick area office um, at 401-826-0842, or you can stop by the office at any time Monday through Friday. Um, someone will be there to assist you. And like I said, you know I've I've been a um, a member here for about two and a half years, and it's been a a very impactful journey. You get to help out people who usually do not get assistance otherwise. So you get to help people keep them or help people stay in their homes that, you know, rather would, um, you know, struggle to make payments and fix those issues on their own. Um, so Deb, I turn it back over to you if you have any questions or concerns um, about our program. So Jake, I do have some questions. There are spaces in Rhode Island that are designated as rural. Um, I've, I've taken a look at the map and when people apply and they're in that rural community, what kinds of things you mentioned a roof, but what other things could these grants or loans, um, be used for? And is there any income restrictions, guidelines, anything at all like that? Yeah, so like I said, our, our most common thing is roofs. Um, everybody will need a roof, uh, you know, for their home at some point in their their lifetime. So roofs are a common thing. But you know, in most recent years, we've seen a lot of um, mobility things. So if somebody needs a bathroom uh, modification and you know doesn't really have the funds to pay for it, you know, USDA is a great option if you are in that rural area. Um, furthermore, cleaning up um, any sort of utility issues, you know, with water. Uh, plumbing, all of that kind of stuff. If you have issues with that and again, cannot pay for it out of pocket, USDA is there and will hopefully be able to assist you if you are in a rural area. Um, I'm actually going to pull up, if you don't mind, our income limits for Rhode mm -hmm. Island, just so I can give you a rough, uh, a better, you know, um, look at what our income is. So I guess that our, our rough income, it's by county for our grant limit is about 25,000. So more often than not, that's usually just um, if they're on social security or a small pension or a little bit of both. 
um, but we also go up to our very low income limit, which you know you are eligible for a loan grant combo in some cases. So you do get some grant, but you also have to pay back a loan because um, you know that wouldn't be fair to the people who are on you know just social security need their assistance most. Um, so generally speaking, our very low income um, is between uh, forty eight thousand and fifty thousand um, fifty eight thousand per year. So you know if that's pension, you know social security, and you know you have some other income coming in, um, yes, you're at the top of our range, but that does not mean we can't help in some capacity. That's awesome. And if someone has a loan, um, is there a requirement that they continue to reside? in the house. So for example, there are sometimes um, reverse mortgages and products like that where the individual has to continue to remain in the house. Otherwise, the full outstanding loan becomes due. Are the USDA loans like that? So they are like, you know, if you have a normal mortgage on your home and you want to go sell your property, you know, it's it's difficult to keep up with it. And, you know, you want to downsize a little bit. Um, if mm -hmm. you have any outstanding balance for the mortgage or the loan, um, that would just be taken off the sales price. Um, so like a normal mortgage. And no, there's no restriction on you have to stay in the home like a reverse mortgage does. Oh, that that's wonderful. And the application process about how long does that take? So say somebody is um, watching right now and their loved one or themselves are scheduled to come out of the skilled rehab facility, you know, in the next week or two. Um, how long does the grant application process take? So we do require a lot of documentation. I will be upfront about that. Um, it is a government <laughs> program. So there's usually more paperwork involved than um, with other programs. But nonetheless, usually if you can get your application in and everything is there the first time, I wouldn't say more than you know two, three months um, before you get that grant or loan assistance or both in some cases. Okay. And can it, can it be a situation where, um, I don't know, my septic system is failing now? And so I put out, you know, the, I, I get a, another loan real quick to like solve that so I can flush. <laughs> um, can I use the USDA grant to kind of repay that initial like emergency loan? Yes. So we do reimburse and only reimburse for utilities. So that is your water, septic, plumbing, and electricity is what we view utilities as. So if you do have any issues, like you said, if you can't flush and you need to get that obviously taken care of, you can submit your application. It'll take a couple of months to get everything processed. But once it does, hopefully we can refinance or um, pay off your lender, whoever it is, um, for those emergencies. But, you know, we, we don't always advise that because if for some reason they're not deemed eligible and they're kind of banking on USDA assistance, you're kind of out of luck. So that's a case-by-case -case basis, but we'd rather, you know, if you have questions, please call us and we'll be happy to advise and help out where we can. Okay. And because an ounce of prevention is always worth a pound of cure. <laughs> is it Something, if I know, for example, maybe um, my loved one has been diagnosed with Parkinson's or has recently had a stroke, um, can I apply now to, say, utilize those funds to have a ramp put on the house or to maybe gut the bathroom so that it is um, more accessible? Yes, and that is welcomed. And you had mentioned, you know, you have a loved one. We do welcome, you know, people if they need help with their applications. You know, we see it a lot where family members will be helping out. And as long as we have an okay from the applicant or homeowner that that's okay, you know, my daughter, or my son is going to help out. Mm -hmm. We are happy to work with them and help facilitate that process. And that's good because it's good that you get that okay from the homeowner because there are sometimes some shady people out there who are sending in paperwork just to kind of see whether or not they can get money. <laughs> you know, we hate yes. those scam artists, but they are out there and we always they have are. to be aware of them. Um, so that's good. And then do people need to go to the office in Warwick or can they just call and you can mail out the paperwork? Yes, we can. For a while, we were actually doing that during COVID. We weren't actually even in the office at all. So everything was over, you know, phone or email or through mail. Um, so yes, you know, if you have questions filling out, some people, it's easier just to go to the office and say, 
I have questions. I need help. But otherwise, you know, we can mail out a package. We can set up a phone call to go over the application itself. Um, no, it does not need to be done in the office, but it's certainly there if you need it. That is awesome. That is absolutely awesome. Jake, I'm so glad you had time to to come on today. This is one of those grant and loan programs that not a lot of people know about. Um, and it was one of those resources that I learned about when I was at a resource fair. So really glad you could come on and share today. Yes, thank you for having us. I appreciate it. Thank you. So like I said, what we're doing is not possible without the support of our annual sponsors. And so I want to give a big shout out to Aetna and Oak Street Health and United Healthcare and Neighborhood Healthcare. It's their support that enabled RI Elder Info to be at the resource fair where we learned about the USDA grants. And it's amazing to have their support that allows us to continue to the work we do. So my next guest is an individual that is head of a program that usually has a lot of questions and a lot of um, a lot of things that people just get stuck on. So I am really, really happy that Director Rosalie Andre from the Rhode Island Department of Human Services, Long-Term Services and Supports, is able to join us today to talk about the Medicaid application process. Hi, Rose. Hi, good morning. Good, good morning. morning, everyone. Let me pull up my slide. Yeah. You know, it's it's interesting because so often people don't understand that Medicare does not cover long-term care. And so they skip a conversation about what does it look like if I need care and I may not have the financial resources to pay privately out of pocket. And I think it's really important for people to understand who's eligible for the Medicaid program. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times folks get those two things confused. You know, Medicare, the easier way to remember is Medicare. We care for our elderly and our disabled. Medicaid, we aid those who have some financial limitations. And many times our older adults are both. Um, and so it's important to understand those differences. Yeah, I think I'm yep. having, yeah, sorry about that. That's all right. If you want, you can always shoot me over the PowerPoint or shoot it over to Ben and he can bring it up from backstage. Okay, and, and I am so sorry. What is Ben's um, email? Yep. Ben, you want to drop that in the chat? There we go. So you can just copy and paste right out of the chat and send that over to him. Okay. And then we can get that over. Okay. And while Ben's loading that backstage, what kind of resources and how can people reach your office? Um, so for... Um, I oversee the Medicaid long-term services and support program. Um, so I focus more on the um, LTSS um, side of Medicaid. So we have a main phone number. Hold on one second. Let me just add this email. It's that multitasking. Yes. And yeah. um, oh, I did send it to Ben. And folks go. can call our main number. I don't have it by heart, but I will show that on the slide. <laughs> no problem. And they can contact us via um, email if they have access to email. Okay. That's always good. And are people generally um, quick to be able to respond to inquiries? Yes. Yeah, so right for the email, we have someone who usually responds within two business days. Um, okay. For the LTSS phone line, um, the latest I looked, our wait is about five to seven minutes. Okay. Uh, but we do have social caseworkers and eligibility technician on the line. If someone calls the LTSS line, who it's it's saying um, the email is not. Um, all right, let me mm -hmm. 
I'm so sorry. That's okay. And when you're talking about the, the coverage line, I think that's the one 697 4347 number. Or you can always email at dhs.ltss at dhs.ri.gov. And you know it's a safe place to email because it does end in .gov. So that's one of those things if you are a viewer out there and you're wondering whether or not an email to a government agency is legitimate, having it end in .gov is something that you can trust. Now, if it's some weird name at .gov, maybe ask some questions about that email that you're using. But when it comes to long-term services, yeah. Deb, I, I wanted to say I um, sent this to you because um, okay. for, for some reason um, the... Um, it's not working. Yeah, it's... Um, Ben wasn't working, so I sent it to you. No problem. And see, that's the I magic. can start without. Yeah, I can start without um, having um, the presentation. Okay. And that's the magic of three, two, one media. Yes. Ben is backstage <laughs> that can can make things appear and disappear, and all of those. All right, so long-term services and support is a, oh, I think it's, is it showing now on here? Long-term services and support um, is a, I usually tell people it's a higher level of um, Medicaid. So in addition to community uh, access to what is offered under community Medicaid, so primary health services, folks can apply for additional support under long-term services and support. Um, and customers have to meet not only the financial eligibility for Medicaid, they also have to meet, meet the clinical eligibility for Medicaid. So they have to go to what we call a level of care determination process to determine whether or not they meet the high level of care or highest level of care. Under high level of care, folks can access LTSS in the home and community-based setting. So home care agency, we have a self-directed program, um, and we also have assisted living. If you meet a high level of care, you can access long-term services and support in those settings. For nursing facility setting or long-term hospital, um, like Eleanor Slater, um, as well as a variety of the nursing homes, you have to meet a highest level of care. Once we've determined that, the customer then have a choice of um, where they want to receive their LTSS benefit, whether it's in a nursing home or home and community-based setting. And if it is in a home and community-based setting, they can access the variety of program. I mentioned assisted living, um, and we, as well as our self-directed program, which is we have the independent provider, a quick summary of the independent provider is that the state has access to, um, has a uh, portal with a lot of individuals who are, um, who can provide home care for you. So customers can access, um, if they don't have a family member, to care for them and they don't want to go through the agency service door, they can go through that portal and find someone to care for them. Personal choice, if someone has a family member, we know a lot of us, we have um, family members taking care of us. If you like that person to get paid to take care of you, you can go through that personal choice model. You can go through that IP model, but that person would have to register as part of the state um, the state um, portal in order to um, access home care. Oh, here it is. is there we go. Showing up. That's it. I know we were okay. having some difficulties because when we were talking about uh, security and .gov, it was behind mm -hmm. a secure wall there. <laughs> okay. So um, what I wanted to cover today, this is just a... a the goals of what I wanted to touch base today. So I think I've gone through the definition of long-term care, the difference, 
and the clinical. So I, I'll talk a little bit about the financial um, eligibility. So to be qualified for LTSS, your resources have to be below 4,000. If you're a single individual, if you are a couple, the maximum resource limit is 6,000. Um, we, we do a six compared to community Medicaid for long-term services and, and support, we do a 60 months look back. So we look at your resources, your asset and resources going back to five years. Now income, there is an income threshold for LTSS is very high. I think it's like over $9,000. So what the way we do with LTSS is anything above our personal need allowance is paid towards your cost of care. And I'll talk about what the different personal need allowance are for the different settings. But if you're making $5,000, $6,000 and you are, you are in a nursing home, what will happen is we will subtract for nursing home, it's about $50. We would subtract that any other medical expense that you may have and then the difference between that um, those deductions and your income would be paid toward the nursing facility and then the state then will come and pay the rest of your stay so we tell people your excess income is used toward your cost of care we do evaluate spousal um, assets and income and we do have a formula for that Um, I talked a little bit about the highest or high level of care, which is the clinical functioning part for LTSS. And then I talked a little bit about the different settings. So we have shared living. Um, you can go through a home care agency. Shared living model is where um, you can choose to go live in the home of someone or someone can come and live with you and they're responsible to take care of you 24 hours a day. And that person, they get a stipend to take care of you. A home care, um, you can get that through um, DHS or the Office of Healthy Aging. And this is where you go through a home care agency and that home care agency provides someone to um, come and care for you on a daily basis. You can access LTSS via adult day. And I touch based on the personal choice and the independent provider. What I also want to uh, let people know, a lot of time we talk about the elders and adult with disability population, and we don't talk a lot about folks with developmental disability. LTSS also covers those services. So if you have someone in your family who was diagnosed uh, with developmental disability at the correct age, they can go through um, the DD door, so BHDDH, also have a whole set of program that is covered by LTSS for customers who are going through that door. And again, this is just a summary of all of the home and community-based services. If you're choosing not to be in an institutional setting and you wanna be in the community, these are all the different options of programs that you could choose that will best fit your, me your needs to remain safely in the community. How do you apply for LTSS? Um, you can apply for LTSS in a variety of ways. We really encourage you to use the customer portal. You can create an account in the customer portal. We have the paper application, which is the DHS2 application. I wanna also flag folks who are already active on community um, Medicaid. So I talked about how LTSS is just a higher level of Medicaid. So if you're already active on community Medicaid and you're looking to access the long-term services support component of Medicaid under LTSS, we have a way to make it more streamlined for you. So you can submit what we call a short form. And later on, uh, and as part of this attachment, there's a lot of different forms that I'll, come, I'll go through quickly for you. You can also call our... Um, Customer, the DHS customer and uh, NET can help you apply over the phone. We also have social caseworkers who can reach out to you and help you apply over the phone. We've trained our staff with what we call telephonic signatures so they can work with you over the phone and record your signature over the phone. People also can apply uh, through the point. 
Um, and if you go through any of our um, offices, um, you'll have somebody to help you apply for LTSS. So there are so many different ways you can apply to access the program. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the forms that are required um, to access LTSS. Um, I talked about the um, DHS to the, the paper application the different way. For LTSS, for the clinical functional aspect evaluation of LTSS, we do need to, depending on the setting, if you're going to be in a nursing facility or if you're going to be in the community, we do need supplemental clinical information in order to make that level of care determination of high or highest. So for, as you could see, if you're going to be in a home and community-based setting, our social caseworkers would go out to your home or telephonically, they will do what we call a functional assessment. If um, And then we would ask that you submit associated medicals. So your last doctor's visit summary that may have your diagnosis, the medications that you're getting. I know a lot of people are familiar with what we had, which was the PM1. The PM1 is no longer a required form. If you ha can have it filled out, that's great. If you're having difficulty getting into a doctor and you have access to your medical portal and you can print out information related to your diagnosis, the medications that you're getting, and just a, a, an overview of your functioning from your last doctor's visit, our nurses will utilize that to make a determination for home and community-based setting. For a nursing home, we definitely need what we call the uh, pass or ID screening. And this is really to rule out uh, folks with behavioral health issues or developmental disability. Um, and that form is required to be, uh, you are required to be screened with those, um, those different functioning before you can be admitted in a, in a nursing facility. So we do need that form in our, or also our nurses can also access um, what we call the MDS. It's a nursing home where the nursing facilities will enter all of their evaluation. So our nurses can also access that information in order to make a determination. So we're trying to really streamline access for you. So you're able to submit the application for us to quickly make um, a determination. There are other forms. So we have a releases. We're not able to exchange information without a release. So if you have someone helping you out for the nursing facilities, we need you to do sign a release. But basically to access LTSS, the application, supportive, um, clinical and medical information, and then if we do send out a letter saying we need additional information from you, DHS will try um, its best to access third uh, party resources that have been approved by the federal government. So we have access to social security, we have access to an employment based system, we have access to asset verification through banking. If we're still struggling to get that information, we will send you out a a letter giving you about 14 days to submit that application. So we ask you to please respond to those letters and submit the information that we're asking for in order to make the financial and clinical determination. I know I'm going fast and um, Deb, please let me know if you want me to stop in the middle um, and take any questions. So there was a question that did come up um, because some folks are not necessarily posting in the comments. They're mm -hmm. sending me messages. Okay. For you had mentioned that individuals um, with intellectual disabilities may be eligible through the BHDDH door. What happens if there are individuals who've had a traumatic event, um, maybe a car accident or a stroke, um, and are now considered disabled? but they don't fit through the, the traditional categories and they need help. How does that work? So they would apply through regular LTSS and then we have, um, there's a uh, part of LTSS. Uh, in addition, folks with traumatic brain injury can get additional services. Um, so beyond just a normal EAD LTSS program. So there are additional support that folks can get with traumatic brain injury 
it, so you have a choice to go through the DD door. And if you don't, because I know with DD, you have to have had the diagnosis. I, I don't remember if it's before the age of 21 or, or the diagnosis would have been part of those that exist before folks are under the age of 21, I believe. So we can support you through our, what we call the HAB program. It's a habilitation program that a lot of folks with TBI are accessing that and LTSS would pay for those services. So when you when you apply for LTSS, we do what we call person-centered option counseling, or if it's during the functional assessment, the social workers identify that, they would make a referral um, to our Office of Community Program at EOHHS. It's overseen by a person I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, Linnea Tuttle. Um, she oversees the HAB program, so we would make a referral, and then she would have someone from her team evaluate you to see whether or not you can take advantage of the benefits available under the HAB program. Awesome. Okay. That, that was just a question that just popped in. So uh, you have a really interesting slide up and I want to make sure that that gets covered because I think people get really mixed up on this. Yeah. So I wanted to talk a little bit about when we talk about cost of care. So for LTSS, your resources determine eligibility, but your income goes towards your cost of care if you're below that high maximum that I was talking about. So, so we talk about what we call the personal need allowance. So for nursing home, we subtract from your income $50 plus any other allowable ex um, expenses or allowances. So if, if you have a spouse, the spousal allowance, there's a lot of other allowance that we can subtract from your income before we determine your cost of care. For assisted living, it's $120 is a personal need allowance. But assisted living, the way I usually explain to folks is, in addition to your personal need allowance, you have to pay the rent to the assisted living facility. So in order for um, assisted living to be accessible to folks, the state has a formula that caps the room and board rate compared to what the private pay rate for assisted living is. So if the assisted living facility accepts Medicaid long-term care, they're supposed to cap your room and board rate to, and that's the formula. So it's a hundred percent of uh, federal benefit rate, which is about 841 plus 332. And then we subtract your personal need allowance. So I think the rate is about, I guess, I think it's a, a thousand fifty-eight or something like that. So that's what you would pay to the assisted living for your room and board, and then the state then will pay for your service. So they'll reimburse the assisted living for the LTSS services that they're providing. So your, if, you know, home care services, if they have someone to help you with your personal care at the assisted living, there's a different um, tier level based on your need that the state reimburse the assisted living. So I try to compare home and community-based services at home where you're paying for your rent and we give you a deduction for um, your personal need allowance and then assisted living, your personal need allowance is 120, you pay for your rent and then the state pays for your um, home care services need. If you are not in an assisted living facility and you're at home, the allowance is 300% of federal benefit rate. So it's 841 times three, which I think it's about 25 and change. And that allowance takes into consideration, you know, rent expense that you may have and other expense that you may have. So that's what, instead of the state doesn't subtract compared to other program where we might take into consideration how much you pay for rent and utilities. For LTSS, it's a flat 300% uh, benefit rate that is supposed to take into consideration your rental expense and your, your utilities. We do take into consideration medical expenses that you have and other allowable costs before we assess the cost of care. But prior to assessing the cost of care, we subtract all of those expenses and anything above that uh, between your income and above what we've deducted, that's what you would pay towards your cost of care. 
So Any another questions on that. I know that's a little complicated. Yeah. You know, it it's interesting because a lot of times I think there's this misperception that the nursing home wants to take the house. No, no, they're not in the business of taking houses. Medicaid does not want to take houses. And when you think about the cost of care, according to Genworth Financial Cost of Care Calculator, the average nursing home here in Rhode Island is $312 per day. Yeah. And so I don't like doing math, so I'm going to do some rounding. Say, for example, your social security check is $950 a month. Okay. You get to keep the first 50 under Medicaid. The other $900 that goes towards that nursing home is really only paying for three days. And then Medicaid covers the rest. And I think yes, yeah. a lot of times, you know, folks get that a little mixed up and the same thing, you know, for assisted living. So, Linda Smith had a really good question. Does mm -hmm. Medicaid cover memory care facilities? Um, she didn't specify if she means nursing home facilities or assisted living facilities. Um, the question was just, does Medicaid cover memory care facilities? Yeah, so it's more of the services if the facility accepts Medicaid. So memory care, is under the sets of service that you would receive is approved under our health long-term uh, services waiver. So it, I think the biggest concern sometimes is whether or not the facility that you're in is a Medicaid provider. If they are a Medicaid provider, then you apply for LTSS and the, the LTSS or Medicaid will cover the comprehensive services that they've been approved uh, to offer as a Medicaid provider. So I, I know it's not a direct yes or no, but it's, I wanted to clarify that the facility has to be a Medicaid provider. So, and if they are, then the memory care that has been approved for them to provide as a provider, Medicaid would cover that. Awesome. And you said in order for people to qualify, um, some of the things that can be counted towards being financially eligible could be the cost of your healthcare services and support. So if you have that $950 that's coming in, but maybe you have a prescription that's like $200 and you need maybe um, adult incontinence supplies that are another $100, so those things get subtracted from that 950, correct? So then your the income is really 650? So eligibility is based on like your resources and other. Now the mm -hmm. your income that you're talking about is more toward what you pay toward your cost of care if it's below that 9,000. So for community Medicaid, we take into consideration if you're under, if you're over the threshold, you're, you're not qualified for, um, EAD Medicaid or the community Medicaid or will put you through different tier spend down. But for LTSS, you are qualified for Medicaid plus the LTSS coverage. We just ask you to pay the excess income toward your cost of care. So um, continent supplies, it depends on the setting. So mm -hmm. if you're a nursing home, they're supposed to be providing that under the LTSS coverage. So the expense, mm -hmm. Medicare definitely is a deduction and other deductions are things that are not covered by Medicaid or the LTSS um, portion of Medicaid. So if you're uh, submitting a receipt for a service that should be billed to Medicaid or should be provided under Medicaid, we wouldn't be able to deduct that because it's that service is covered under Medicaid. Yep. Um, so a lot of time I know that people in, sometimes we have customers in nursing home, they may have a choice of, you know, what the nursing home is providing. There might be a concern with that. It will be very hard for us to reimburse uh, or give you credit or deduction for 
a service that is covered under um, Medicaid. Got it. It just, it, there's so much to the Medicaid LTSS long-term services and supports application process. If people have more questions, what was the number that they can reach out to again? I am also going to give another uh, phone number. Let me go into. Um, so oh, great. For LTSS, um, the 401-574-8474 number, I would say is the first contact you want to call now. The reason we give the main DHS number, the 855, is if there are issues, you know, we might have a storm and there's a problem with the phone line, so we always want to give alternative. But your first um, phone call should go through the 401-574. And if you're having trouble with that line, for whatever reason, you can call the main number. So LTSS, we have a line, which is a, a little bit, the wait is a little bit less. It's, it's under seven minutes um, on that. And we also have that staff with social caseworkers as well. And I encourage you, if you have access to email, please um, email and you'll get a, a, a quick turnaround. Deb, I know I'm out of time. I just want to touch base a little bit on emergency Medicaid. A lot of folks in the home and community-based se setting, they don't use um, expedited eligibility. So if you have a need for home care services today because you're getting discharged from the hospital or you don't want to be in a nursing home, you want to be at home, please reach out to that number. There's a way that we can approve you for temporary LTSS for up to 90 days pending all of the documents that I talked about. And we can do that within five business days, especially if you have a home care provider willing to take you that day, we can approve you under expedited eligibility to receive that care at home that you don't feel that you have to go into a facility or you have to remain in the hospital because you're waiting for LTSS. So I wanted to plug in our expedited um, eligibility that we're trying to get folks to take advantage of. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rose. Again, so much great information. It is just a lot. Yeah, <laughs> and I, yeah. I think I'll have you come on a Friday, friend, so that we can talk about this more in depth because it's just one of those things that a lot of people have a hard time understanding how it all works. Great. So thank you so much for coming on today. And thank you so much for participating with us last week as well. This was yes, great. Thank you for the opportunity. And my apologies again for the slow start. Oh, that happens. Okay. All thank right. You. Have a nice afternoon. Okay. Bye-bye. Thanks. So, you know, folks, seriously, we can't do this without the support of our sponsors. So thank you to Aetna and Oak Street Health, United Healthcare, Neighborhood Health, AARP, the Alzheimer's Association, PACE, Washington Trust, Butler Memory and Aging, CareLink, Commonwealth Care Alliance, the Foundation for Financial Freedom, Home Mobility Pros, Law Offices of Howe and Garside, Lavindi, Newport Mental Health, Oakley Home Access, Ocean State Center for Independent Living, the Visiting Nurse Home and Hospice, and White Cross Pharmacy. Really, really some great partners to be able to get this information out to you. And speaking of greatness, Rhode Island has a nationally recognized expert on aphasia. And aphasia is one of those things that has really become a hot topic when Bruce Willis was diagnosed with it um, a few months ago. And then we saw a lot of talk about aphasia in the elections when we had John Fetterman, um, all over our news on a regular basis. And he is someone who has aphasia. So I'd like to welcome the executive director of Just Ask, Aphasia Stroke Knowledge, and a national speaker, Denise Lowell. Hi, Deb. How are you? Good. Are we working okay? All we, are work we are working good. Good. <laughs> uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's so good to be able to out here and share my knowledge about aphasia and the resources that we have here in Rhode Island. Do you have a slide deck? I do. There we go. There, ooh, oh, magic. Right. There we go. So Just Ask is aphasia, stroke, and knowledge. This is a nonprofit organization. 
Um, it was established in 2019 um, as I suffered a stroke and I am living with aphasia. Um, I couldn't find as much resources that I wanted here in our state. So I started to create this nonprofit organization, which we've been running for years now. And our goal is to provide resource, education, and support, not just for individuals living with um, stroke and traumatic brain injuries, but their care partners and the stakeholders that we all have in contact with in Rhode Island, which I was so pleased to be part of this because so much of the resources and tools that you are sharing um, doesn't just necessarily work with people who are seniors or people that have intellectual disabilities. Some of us are somewhere in the gap and we have um, a lot of resources we need to give everybody a little outline of what is aphasia. Deb said we had a lot of information about it, but do we really know now that we've heard the word? Um, it affects somebody's um, ability to either speak, read, write, and maybe some little bit of comprehension, which just means it's delayed a little bit. Does not mean that there's a lack of any intelligence. The intelligent is still intact. We have another slide here. So some of the resources that we provide, we are, we provide in Rhode Island, is that we have a lot of resource tools, such as an identification identification card that shows people that we do have aphasia, and sometimes we may need a little bit of assistance or a lot of patience to let us finish our statements or to say what we need to say. I think um, you're seeing um, a lot of people now um, acknowledging it. Um, some of the tools that we provide for them is these visor cards. So should you be in um, a situation and you get pulled over by a policeman or you have a flat tire and you're just a little um, frustrated and can't communicate as effectively because of a stress situation, which I think we've all been through a stressful situation and not able to do what we wanted to do. These here tools will help people with some communication tools. We also go out and provide um, education to our community. Um, we've gone to hospitals, we've gone to schools, um, we do either a virtual um, format or we go in person in the state of Rhode Island. Um, we also provide a lot of resource and support for those that are living with aphasia or with um, some type of traumatic brain injury or with a stroke. Um, communication and getting back into um, the facility, go out and with people again. Um, it is really sometimes challenging. So we have support groups which allow people to get together and um, have fun. Um, it's our social network group, which is held every Monday night. Uh, we have games. We have uh, we play um, we play the games. We do arts. We uh, we do tid talk. We talk about what's going on in the community. Um, it's just a fun time. I think a lot of people have a lot of these support groups, which is great. I think you need it. You need that place. But what our group does is we provide you an opportunity to practice talking, getting out into a social environment, and helping you have fun. I mean, that's what life is about. Let's have fun. So I think that's the rest of my presentation. I know there's so much information I could share. Um, I'll go over some of the basics. How's that? Um, some of the common things that people don't know is that there's over 200 million people living with aphasia. Um, you might hear more about their traumatic brain injury. You might hear about a stroke, but people don't actually identify that word aphasia. Um, I think it's even more common than Parkinson's, um, muscular dystrophy, and people don't hear it. So I'm glad to hear that people are saying it out there more. They're talking about it and how common it is. Um, 
I did not speak as well as I am now, um, now that I am in my seventh year of a stroke survivor. So I can understand the challenges that happens and how you have to work hard to get better. But a lot of people with aphasia will still continue to struggle with the speech piece. That does not say that their their lack of intelligence, um, their intelligence intact. They just do it a different way that they used to. Denise, I wanted to ask you: when you first had your stroke, and you had aphasia, what was that experience like? Like, could you tell people? like to slow down you're talking too fast or could you could you read from a menu or things like that like how how else can aphasia look to people on the outside when you're looking at someone with aphasia saying i don't get it well that's one of those invisible disabilities um people don't see um if we had off uh, most most people that have had a stroke traumatic brain injury does have the physical bit um the disability that's physical um usually have some type of um, paralyzation or um changing in their their range on their right arm or their right leg um but again if you've known anybody's had a stroke sometimes that affects different parts of your body not just your brain <laughs> so um when my speech started to when i tried to speak I had trouble with saying what I wanted to say. I would think of one word, but it would come out differently. One example is sometimes if I wanted a Coke, the word butter came out. I don't know <laughs> why they came out. If I wanted to identify the men in my family, they were all husbands. Anybody that was a man, the word would come out as a husband. I knew that wasn't my husband. I know that's my son. But for some reason, the neurological change in my brain only wanted to come out with that word. Um, over the years, it does get better. Um, and it, it's a long process. And I think people don't understand that. Um, so when my improving of my speech went so well, what people don't see now is that I have... I am still continuing to work on my reading and writing. Um, these here letters on the bottom here, for me to sit and read would take me a little bit longer. I can still read. It just takes a little bit longer to read. I use these special glasses to help with my peripheral vision, which doesn't work as well as it used to. So I have some special glasses that help me. I also use accommodations to help me with reading. I have different types of readers on my computer. I have special um, computers that read my books for me. Um, so there's a lot of to my computers reading to me now because it heard that I wanted to read. So it picks up on my words. Computer. I hear her talk. <laughs> So, and those are a lot of the accommodations and tools that I use that people don't see how much work that is for me to do what I do to go out and um, give people that have more of the challenge with reading, giving them a voice. And you are a wonderful advocate and for individuals who have aphasia. Can you tell me, do you do any kind of trainings for the public or for professionals who may work with individuals who have aphasia? Do you do any kind of um, CEU, continuing education unit trainings or things along those lines for, for folks? Yes, we do our annual um, aphasia conference, which is the only aphasia conference in Rhode Island. We provide that every, every June as June is aphasia awareness month. We run a um, program every Saturday in the month of June by professionals, which gets CEUs from speech pathologists. Speech pathologists are our are, are fixers, our gatekeepers. And once we get some recovery and improving, we work with our speech pathologists to help us on all components, not just the speaking, the reading, the writing, and the processing to pick up our speed again. The same as if you had a... Um, 
a leg injury, you'd have to go to a PT and you'd have to work on your leg to get better. People with aphasia will work with a um, SLP. Okay. Now, just ask aphasia stroke knowledge. Did you mention it's a nonprofit? It is a nonprofit organization. Uh, I think you can give me those numbers. What we are, we're 501c3. Yes, we are. So (laughs) we do, um, all of our work is done through donations and through um, fundraisers. Um, Our fundraisers will help us um, do community events. This year, we actually invited individuals with traumatic brain injury, people with a stroke, care partners, professionals to join us in a private viewing of Gabby Gifford's movie. Gabby Gifford is another individual that's getting a lot of attention as somebody living with aphasia. She suffered her traumatic brain injury due to the gun accident. So she was actually able to show people real life experience, how you can improve. Um, It may look a little different than she used to, but her intelligence still intact. She's still working as hard as she can, but it's a little different. (laughs) And I think that's really the important message is just because someone is having difficulty with speaking doesn't mean that there's not tech access out there that can enable individuals to live a full life, that there's not resources out there. Um, And I believe you're going to a national conference to speak. You're representing Little Rhodey. Yes, we are going to, um, I'm working with another friend of mine who lives in Florida, and we are both presenting about the mental health piece that goes with um, living with aphasia um, and how um, our mental health is also very important, not just for us, for anybody to go through your um, treatment program. If you're not ready, you're, you're feeling depressed, you're, you, you're feeling frustrated, um, you have anxiety, um, we can't do the best we can. So working with professionals, they need to be aware of that. You know, you can do the best you can, but if you don't provide them the tools and the resources to be ready to learn more and to move to the next stage, um, those are the facts that professionals need to be aware of. And I, that's what we're presenting in New Orleans for the ASHA com- conference. That is awesome. Denise, I'm so glad you were able to join us today. I know you have a crazy busy schedule. And thank you so much. And thank you for being a wonderful representative of the fact that individuals can have a stroke, have aphasia, and create a nonprofit and become a national speaker. (laughs) Life goes on. But again, I would like to thank you, Deb, because I think a lot of people that fill in that gap, you you know, and you're not the younger ones, you don't have a disability there, you may not have intellectual disability, you're not a senior, but there are still services and things available. So I know a lot of my younger friends here say, well, I'm not a senior, no, those programs don't apply to me. They do. So I'm really trying to see that people understand that there are resources and tools, regardless of your age or your disability. You just have to get out there and um, check it out. And I thank you for what you do to provide us those resources. Thank you so much for coming today, Denise. I really appreciate it. Well, everybody, thank you to our sponsors, the Alzheimer's Association and AARP and Oakley Home Access, Pace and Washington Trust. We have one more speaker left, but I encourage you, please stay to the end because I have a very special raffle that I want to do here on camera. So make sure you stay, even though we might run over by a few minutes. It's super important. So I would like to welcome up MTM, Rhode Island's Non-Emergency Medical Transportation. Welcome, Paul. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. How are you today? Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on today. Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the tell opportunity. People, yeah. Tell people what is non-emergency medical transportation? What is MTM and what is it not? <laughs> sure. Sure. So essentially, MTM, we're a statewide broker. Um, we contract with 78 um, plus transportation companies and we offer, uh, I guess, a non-emergency medical transportation service. Um, so essentially, what, what does that mean? Um, 
you need a ride, if you're a Medicaid member, you need a ride to a doctor's office. If you're an ongoing dialysis patient that needs transportation to and from, um, essentially you give us a call uh, and we'll arrange transportation for you. Uh, it's like I previously said, if you're a Medicaid member, um, it is part of your benefit. There's no cost to you. Um, and then if you are actually any Rhode Island resident aged 60 or over, um, you can also call as well. Um, there's a $2 copay for the program. Um, but yeah, we're, we're here to get you to, uh, to and from your medical appointments. So um, a little about MTM. Um, we've been in Rhode Island since 2019. Um, we do have a dedicated Rhode Island team uh, along with a dedicated Rhode Island contact center. So if you're calling us, um, you will speak to Rhode Island based representatives. Um, there's a Rhode Island logistics team um, of it's currently five people and it's tasked with managing our transportation providers and their associated performance. And then we also have a Rhode Island based quality team. Um, so that is components of uh, a member facing ombudsman, um, a dedicated facility resource, uh, along with um, a quality specialist who's tasked with um, managing complaints. Um, so of our network, I mentioned 78, that's plus or minus. So we're constantly recruiting new providers to make sure we have an adequate network and make sure that we have top quality providers. Um, so that consists of owner operators. Think of your one car uh, mom and pops. Um, we have several small businesses we contract with. Um, we have what's called, a, we call a sole source. So if you're a facility or if you're attending say an adult day and they have their own transportation, um, they'll actually contract with us directly as well to get reimbursed. Um, we do utilize TNCs, so your Ubers and Lyfts. And then we also contract with both stretcher and ambulance companies. Um, so you can do the next slide. Um, how do you use our service? Um, so we offer a couple different ways how to contact us. Um, we offer an online member portal. Um, so if you're not um, necessarily want to talk to anybody, you can go onto our website uh, and book transportation. Uh, and then we also offer a member chat online too. So uh, if you just want to um, chat with a, a live agent, um, you can do that through our website. Um, I had mentioned we have a Rhode Island contact center. Um, so you can call us 24 um, seven. So that, that is staffed uh, and you will be able to speak with a live representative. Um, and then we actually have some options for facilities and actually MCOs as well. Um, we offer an online portal that um, facilities can use to manage their members' transportation. So if they're booking transportation on behalf of their members, um, they can do that completely online. Um, a couple caveats, we do ask the trips are booked 48 hours um, in advance, and that's just to give us time to assign it to a transportation provider, give the transportation provider to properly schedule it. Um, we are uh, available for urgent trips. So if you're calling with, with an immediate need, um, we will. you can give us a call and we will actually take um, take the reservation, attempt to cover the trip. Um, if we do next slide. So who is this service available to? Um, obviously every member, but um, that's enrolled in Medicaid, but also you can have a family member book for you, um, a social worker or a case manager, they can book transportation on behalf of a member. Um, think at home caregivers, certainly uh, facilities if they're managing transportation for their members. It's really anybody that can verify your HIPAA um, and act as an agent for, um, for you. Uh, so a couple pieces of information we'll need when calling. Um, certainly the member will need the Medicaid ID if they're calling to use the Medicaid benefit. Um, which wouldn't directly apply if you're just a Rhode Island resident age six year or we're taking advantage of the elderly transit program. We don't obviously need that. Um, we will need to verify your home address and phone number. Uh, and then we, we need to know where you're going to go. So the healthcare provider's name, uh, phone number and address, um, the date and time of the appointment, and then any special needs, um, including if you need somebody to ride with you, if you need perhaps door to door service versus the traditional just curb to curb, um, any special needs will be communicated at time of booking. One thing we also offer too is the gas mileage reimbursement program. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, thank you. Uh, one back actually. Um, so we actually offer a reimbursement program if you're capable or if you have a friend or family member that can transport you to the appointment, we'll actually reimburse you for the gas. Um, so it's priced at 32 cents per mile and that's both to and from the appointment. So think you're going to a doctor's office, you can have your a close family member or a neighbor or a friend to take you. Um, well, we'll pay you directly, uh, 32 cents reimbursable per mile traveled. Um, so both, again, both from your house or from your residence to the doctor's office and then from the doctor's office back to your residence. And we've really found this is one of the most safest, convenient ways um, of travel. Um, so we really encourage that. And this is both for Medicaid and the elderly transit program. Paul, there was a question that came in. Um, can a person who does not have Medicaid get reimbursed for gas mileage? 
Uh, her husband used MTM to take him to and from memory care, and she's wondering if there may be mileage reimbursement for that. Absolutely. So when the program first started in 2019, it was specifically just for Medicaid members, but um, with the rise of COVID, we were actually able to expand that to the elderly transit program as well. And the elderly transit program covers any Rhode Island resident aged 60 or over. So at 100%, if you give us a call, we can set you up um, in the gas mileage reimbursement program. Um, essentially, what will happen is you'll get a trip log. You have the facility sign the trip log. You send it back to us and we'll send you uh, a debit card with, um, with funds. It's a great option if you're doing some sort of recurring transportation. So if you go and say uh, a good example is dialysis, if you go three times a week, it really does add up. And especially with, with both inflation and the rising cost of gas, it's a really great benefit to take advantage of and really help offset some of those um, pricier um, options. Absolutely. And the person receiving the ride does not need to be on Medicaid for that. Correct. As long as they're aged 60 and over. Awesome. Okay. I just wanted to get that out there. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. Yep. Um, so how we determine which mode of transportation we'll actually use. Um, and of course, modes range from public transportation, bus, all the way up through stretcher and ambulance service. Um, so if you're calling in on, on a, say, like a Tuesday um, and you reside within a half mile of a bus stop uh, and then your final destination is also within a half mile of a bus stop, um, the first mode will be public transit. Now, if for whatever reason you can't take public transit, we have, um, we call it a level of need process, um, but essentially it's a note from your doctor just stating why you can't take public transit. Uh, it's completely automated. So um, during the trip intake process, when you're calling to make that reservation, we'll ask um, if, if public transportation is appropriate for you. If you indicate you'd rather not, um, we'll just collect your, um, your healthcare provider's information. We'll send them the form. We'll send them instructions on how to return it to us. And we'll also give you two weeks of transportation during that time to give um, the healthcare provider time to get that form back to us um, for you to travel on either cab service or uh, if you need hot mode higher than that, um, say like stretcher, say a power lift service, you'll have that for the two weeks. We don't need that right away to start the service. Um, and then you actually get two of those per year. Um, so it, it say the provider unfortunately doesn't get the form back to us. You still get another two week period. Um, so that's how we determine what's the most appropriate mode. Um, Quick question then, for you on the mode of transportation. Mm -hmm. If somebody is able to say, use their walker in their house and use their walker um, into the doctor's office, but they need somebody to kind of just kind of offer a little bit of support or a hand to hold to go down their front steps. Are the drivers able to provide that little bit of support or is that not available because there is some liability for that? No, that's, that's a great question. And so I'm, I'm actually happy to say they are available to do that. What the only caveat is they cannot enter the residence or the facility, but they can meet you directly at the door. Um, we okay. call it door to door door service. Um, it, okay. it is something that can be requested at time of booking. Um, the typical service would be curb to curb. Think the driver just pulls up to the curb. Um, yeah. But no, if, if you do need that added level of service, um, it is something we provide. Um, and again, um, our drivers will get out of the vehicle. They will walk um, the member um, to their residence or, or to the appointment's front door um, or from. So that is certainly something we can accommodate. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Next slide, please. So for the return ride, say your appointment's over, um, we do ask that they're ready um, at least 15 minutes prior to the scheduled pickup time. Um, uh, and we do also offer um, a will call option. So say you're calling you booking transportation, you don't know how long your appointment's gonna take. Um, you just indicate that it's it's will call. Um, and, and the CCR is the person taking the reservation. They'll, they'll ask you this. This is information you need to know right off the bat. But they'll essentially ask you what time you'd like to be picked up. And if you don't know, we'll, we'll put it as a, what we call will call. Uh, and that essentially means um, you'll either call MTM directly when you're ready for your pickup. Um, and we'll, we'll call the transportation provider and let them know that you're ready. Uh, it, again, it's no official time. Um, so it's a good option, again, if you don't know what time that is. So what services are actually covered by the transportation? Um, so transportation, it must be a Medicaid covered service. Um, so this includes pharmacy visits. It includes uh, nursing home discharges. Um, we can distribute a full list, but it's anything essentially that is covered by Medicaid. Um, if the member themselves are in a skilled status, they would not qualify for transportation with MTM. 
Uh, Medicaid is the payer of last resort. Um, we can transport out of state. Um, there is an additional form for it, but we do a lot of trips to Boston. We do some trips to Hartford. Um, so if you are seek, seeking levels of care that are not necessarily available in Rhode Island and need that out-of-state transport, um, that is actually an option with MTM that we can provide. Uh, next slide, please. So what if you experience an issue during your transportation? Uh, your provider's late, your appointment's running over. Um, we actually have two outlets. Uh, we do have an official complaint process. Um, you can give us a call at the hotline listed, or you can use our website, or we actually have a direct email you can just email. Um, we encourage complaints. Uh, we want to hear if there's a poor experience, so we ultimately we can correct it, hold our providers accountable, hold ourselves accountable. Um, and then we also have, I previously mentioned, a member and Budsman. Um, so this is a person that works hand in hand with MCOs, with um, healthcare networks. Um, her primary role is really making sure that MTM's policies align with what's best for members, um, really make sure that we're providing the most necessary care, um, that the services we're rendering are appropriate, that they're um, best being utilized. Uh, and she's a great resource for uh, anyone in Rhode Island members, facilities, advocates um, to get in touch with. Um, and then some important contacts to share. Um, so obviously my, myself, um, Darian Stubbs, our transportation manager, um, our ombudsman, Nicole Forsey, and then that uh, dedicated facility outreach, Joseph Carvalho. Um, I, I'd encourage you if you're facing any issues, have any questions on the program, uh, please reach out to us. Um, and we're happy to help. And Paul, I just want to make clear for MTM, is it that you have a fleet of vehicles sitting in a parking lot or are you contracting with other providers you had mentioned um like uber and lyft but are you mm -hmm. contracting with other providers or do you have your own fleet yeah so we actually we operate as a broker um, so we don't own a single vehicle in rhode islands um every all transportation is subcontracted to um, various transportation companies throughout the state these are these are private companies but they do work with us um, we hold them to specific service metrics when they contract with us. So mm -hmm. um, we lay out our expectations and it's essentially that, you know, you're on time, you're providing good service. Um, you're not, you're not generating complaints. Um, and then that network, it varies. It varies based on the needs of uh, Rhode Island. It varies on the uh, provider's performance. That's a big one. If you're not performing for us, we'll let you go um, and seek other opportunities. Um, but yes, it is It is primarily just um, subcontract providers. And one component of that is Uber and Lyft. Um, we don't use them much, but they, they are a good resource um, when one of our traditional providers can't accommodate a trip at the last minute. And when you're using Uber or Lyft, that's not on the person that needs a ride to figure nope. out on the app how to do that. Exactly. That's still calling you guys. Okay. Exactly, exactly. We'll actually dispatch the car. For all intents and purposes, it would, it would be similar to just your transportation provider pulling up. Um, we okay. handle all the dispatching, um, of course, all the payment for it. Um, so, yeah. And people can get a ride to Boston for their care or mm -hmm. Connecticut, that kind of thing. Is is that only if they're on Medicaid or can the elderly transportation program cover that's, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's both, actually. Um, we do have an initial, an additional form, um, and it's essentially, it's just a form that your healthcare provider would fill out stating why this um, this specific um, treatment isn't available in Rhode Island, um, but similar to the level of need, we send that directly to the healthcare provider. It's, it's the member needs no action on their part. Um, so it is a semi-automated process. We just need the healthcare provider's information. Um, and one thing you actually, you just reminded me that I failed to uh, mention for the elderly transit program, mm -hmm. um, it is primarily medical appointments, but it's also, it does offer transportation to senior centers and meal sites. Um, so if that's something that you'd be interested in, in getting transportation for and taking part of, you can give us a call and we can transport you there. That's amazing because there's so many things that are taking place at our senior centers, at our mm -hmm. adult day health programs. Um, because like someone before had said that, you know, getting older isn't just doctor's appointments. Um Sorry. But you guys, now, you don't provide transportation to, like, the grocery store or to go get your hair cut, correct? Correct, correct. Okay. So there's no, there's no like, enrichment activities. It's strictly medical right now. But okay. um, that's definitely something we've we've spoken with with the OHHS. We'd love to expand. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, hopefully more to come. And I'm thinking that that's probably one of those things that we should contact our elected officials to Absolutely. advocate for more Absolutely. funding for Absolutely. to really meet all of the transportation needs that that we have as we get older. Um, and 
when someone is going to the doctor, if they need help from somebody else to get there, you know, maybe the spouse wants to go along or um, a caregiver, are they allowed to to ride with the person or do they have to follow in another vehicle? Nope, nope. They're allowed. So every member is allowed to bring one additional person with them. So it could be a caregiver, a family member, um, in some instances, somebody that they're taking care of. Um, okay. So they are allowed that one additional person. Yep. And just because we do have grand families, about 14,000 grand families out there, if a senior is going to the doctor, but they have a child that needs to go with them because they're the caregiver for the child, um, they provide the senior provides the car seat or can you schedule a vendor who has car seats? That's a great question. So at this time, it's specifically the senior would have to bring the car seat. Um, our okay. providers do not have, uh, they're not equipped with car seats. Okay. That's, a, that's a great call out. Yeah, that's, you know, 14,000 families in Rhode Island are in that situation. Not that everybody needs a car seat, but, you know, it is happening out there. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if somebody had an issue or concern um, about the service, who do they call or where do they reach out to? What was that ombudsman's? Is it the ombudsman or is there like a? Yeah, so it, depending. So we do have a full complaint line. Um, essentially you could call the same, same number that as you, if you were to call uh, to make a transportation reservation. Mm -hmm. Um, we also have on our website, a direct, um, file a complaint. Um, or you can just email, uh, it's literally just QM at MTM Inc. Okay. Um, okay. and again, we, we encourage it. Um, even if you're not, um, letting us know about service areas, you can, you can tell UHHS, tell anybody really, we want to hear about this. We, we don't shy away from complaints. We don't want to see complaints, but we don't shy away from them. So can't fix what you don't know exactly. about, right? Exactly. <laughs> Paul, I'm so glad you were able to take the time out to, to get this done today. And I know that your services, there's a growing need. Um, so it's, it's great that you were able to come on today and share this information and maybe dispel some myths and answer some of the questions that yeah. people have had about MTM lately. Yeah, yeah. So no, I, I, appreciate I appreciate the opportunity. It. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, just a little fun fact that I heard recently, um, most people should expect to spend about six years of their life not being able to drive. So transportation is a huge issue. So I know that we ran over today, but the information that we covered, when I said hot topics this morning, I don't know if you necessarily believed me. So I really hope that you hit the like and the share button. It is recorded, so you can always rewind. If there was something that you didn't catch or you wanted to look at a PowerPoint more closely, all you'd have to do is hit the pause button. And it's absolutely amazing what we've covered today and it would not have been possible without the support of our sponsors we've got Aetna and Oak Street and United Health and Neighborhood Health Plan of Rhode Island who support our work all year long and let us compile these resources we have AARP the Alzheimer's Association Pace and Washington Trust who've supported our in-person and virtual events we also have Butler Memory and Aging and CareLink and Commonwealth Care Alliance and Foundation for Financial Freedom, Home Mobility Pros, the Law Offices of Howe and Garside, Lavindi, really cool technology there with Lavindi, Newport Mental Health, Oakley Home Access, Ocean State Center for Independent Living, sometimes called OSO, the Visiting Nurses Home and Hospice, and White Cross Pharmacy. We couldn't do this without their support. But we also have the support from individual donors who are happy to support our work on an individual basis. And every week we're sending out information and resources in our newsletter. So I want to encourage you, sign up for one of our newsletters. We have them for seniors, for caregivers, for professionals. You can download Operation Connect, the only printed and printable resource guide for military members, veterans, and their families. Just really take some time to visit rielderinfo.com and engage with us because there's a tremendous amount of resources out there for us to get connected to remain independent as we age. And when it comes to supporting, I do want to say at our event last week at the Edward King House, we asked folks if they wanted to sign up for our newsletter, 
they would be eligible to win this lovely gift basket donated to us by the Carenti family. And I held off pulling the, the name last week so that I could do this live so that everybody can see it happen in live time, but I'm not picking any favorites. If you recall, they were put into our purple box. I've untied it so that I can shake it up. And let's see, I'm not looking, I'm not looking, I'm not looking. All right. And the winner is Sharon Lynch. So Sharon, you visited us last week at the Edward King house. I've got your contact information and we will schedule a time to get this lovely gift basket donated to you. So I thank everybody for joining us today. I hope that you've hit the like button, the share button, that you've commented. Give us your feedback. Did this work for you? Did this not work for you? What would you like to see in the future? And Join us tomorrow because we have our Friday friends every Friday at nine o'clock. Thank you all for coming. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow for Friday friends. In the meantime, be well and be kind.